Regional Conference. Time is committed to providing research and training in music technology for contemporary music educators. During the conference, Time is holding drawings on the last day of the conference for $25 iTunes gift cards. Enter by filling out a Time insert card. Your entry will remain in the drawing until the end of the conference. Take them to Executive Director Mike Lawson at the table outside of room C220. You will be called if you are a winner. Also, save $10 on Time memberships today if you see Time Executive Mike Lawson at the table again outside of C220 and sign up using your credit card. You can also sign up online by April 1st and enter the discount code CONFERENCE at the checkout to save $10 on a $50 membership. If you are interested in learning more about the topic of this presentation, you may want to consider taking music technology courses at a time-approved institution or by earning your Time Level 1 or 2 certification. More information is available on the TIME website, which is www.ti-me.org. TIME would like to thank our technology sponsors, Fishman, Presonus, Blue Microphones, and Planet Wave slash Diodario, Capital University, and Schoolhouse Electronics for supporting our technology needs this afternoon. Our two presenters today are Nate Lockwood and Joseph Pasternak. Nate Lockwood is a senior music technology student at Capital University in Columbus. He serves as Vice Chair of the Capital University Audio Engineering Society Student Section. Nate has interned at Forest Drawn Productions in Chicago. Joseph Pasternak is a Senior Music Technology student at Capital University as well. He serves as Chair of Capital University's Audio Engineering Society Student Section. He is an intern currently at John Schwab Recording Studios in Columbus. Without further ado, this is Joseph Pasternak and Nate Lockwood. Um, so this is using audio and MIDI hardware with GarageBand. Um, the, for this presentation is going to be in two parts. Uh, the first part is sort of the slideshow. We're going to overview all the different equipment you might need to kind of put a setup together. I'm going to preface that with you can use GarageBand with just your Mac. You don't need any extra equipment, but this equipment sort of allows you to expand some of the capabilities uh, of GarageBand. So um, anyways, without further ado, uh, let's get going. Um, so some of the, the equipment we sort of could go over today is the computer, the audio interface, MIDI controller, monitors, and microphones. Um, you can use all of this in conjunction with each other, different pieces of parts uh, to put everything together. So just a brief overview, we could go on for days about computers. So this is the lineup of Mac computers. Um, it's the price points. I know at schools lately, Mac minis and iMacs are both really popular computers for schools. Um, Note down there I have PCs that come in a wide range of prices, but GarageBand is not a PC product, it's a Mac only product. Um, but a lot of the, as far as interfacing the equipment, still applies if you're on a PC. Okay, and I'll be taking you through uh, different audio interfaces. Uh, basically your audio interface acts as your hub. It's going to give you all of your, your ins and your outs. Uh, so you can plug your microphones in and plug your speakers in, and it's also going to talk to uh, your computer. Um, what it does, it takes the analog signal from your microphone or instrument, uh, whatever you have plugged in, and converts it to a digital signal and sends that via FireWire or USB uh, to be recorded uh, on your computer. Um, now we have a, a Focusrite Sapphire Pro 24 as our interface, um, and that's FireWire? Yes. Yeah, connected to the computer uh, through FireWire. Um, it gives you a, a bunch of different ins and outs. Um, if you go to the, ne the next slide, yeah. um, I have a listing here of uh, different models. Um, there's the Sapphire Pro series um, that is basically just an expansion of, of each other. Uh, personally, I have the Sapphire Pro 40, which has eight preamps, 20 ins, and 16 outs. Uh, but I'll get into that. Um, you can also get the Persona <coughs> Studio Mobile, which is also uh, very comparable to the Pro 24 uh, in that it's FireWire and has the general same amount of ins and outs and, and preamps. And uh, the Personas Audio Box that was uh, donated to the Time Conference is, is very comp comparable. Um, also, I thought this was interesting. Um, you can do some interfacing with your iPad or, or any iOS enabled device uh, with the Apogee Duet. Uh, it's a little bit different in its uh, make of um, the interface uh, because you actually have to use a breakout cable to actually get into it. It doesn't have you know, all the, the knobs and ins and outs on the box itself. Um, but one thing that you ha do have to be careful of is, uh, I mean, you see the size of, of this. There's only two mic preamps in it, but apparently there's 16 inputs. 
Um, so watch out for that. They're usually saying, yeah, it has two mic inputs and um, two line inputs, but the first two line inputs are going to override your mic inputs. So that lets them say there's more inputs than there actually are, um, or that you can use simultaneously. All right, next we're going to move into uh, MIDI controllers, maybe. There we go, MIDI controllers, all right. Uh, MIDI controllers can come in a variety of shapes. Um, most of what I'm sort of going to talk about here are keyboard-based MIDI controllers. There are also uh, drum pads, MIDI controllers, and crazy things like optical MIDI controllers that when you move your hand, it changes the information. But um, does people, are you guys familiar with MIDI technology here? All right, so MIDI stands for Musical Instrument Digital At Interface, sorry. And um, basically what that means is when I play a key, like on this keyboard over here, it's just sending out data, ones and zeros, that then triggers a device, um, a software device in the computer that actually creates the sound, whatever sound I want. Um, and some MIDI controllers do uh, include onboard sound, so you could use it as like a performance keyboard. The one I have here, the MYO Axiom, does not. Um, MIDI is done usually over two ways, either a five pin MIDI connector, or today, more, more than likely, any MIDI controller you get is just going to have USB out on it and it will plug right into your computer. Um, a couple examples we have, uh, like I said, the M Audio Axiom series, there's 25, 49, and 61 key versions. And I think at NAMM they actually just came out with like a compact 32 key version uh, that actually is like iPad um, compatible. The nice thing about the Axiom is it also has faders, rotary knobs, transport controls, and drum pads and you can go into the software that comes with the keyboard to program those to control other things in GarageBand or whatever software you might be using. Um, there's also the Akai Synth Station, like that one is uh, used to integrate with their iPad app, um, and then the audio outputs, outputs from the iPad to a sound system or an interface. Um, <clears throat> many of you may have a digital piano, a Yamaha or a, a Kurzweil or something like that. Um, a lot of those have MIDI out via either a 5-pin connector or newer ones usually have USB. If you have one of those, you can get a little MIDI to USB adapter that will run the MIDI information right into your computer. And um, the last one I think that's kind of interesting is the M-Audio Key Studio, which is currently, they don't make them anymore, but if you could pick one up, they're really nice. Uh, it's a MIDI keyboard, a 49-key MIDI keyboard. And it also has the audio interface built in, and it all goes over uh, USB. It can do 16-bit 441 recording. It's got a mic input and a line input, and then stereo outputs and a headphone output on it. Um, and it, so it comes included with Pro Tools software, which is another uh, recording software. Uh, so next I'm going to talk about uh, monitors. Uh, so eventually you're going to want to be able to hear what you're recording and what you have recorded. Uh, so you can hear input and playback, uh, depending on how you have it set up. Um, there's two types of monitors, uh, active monitors and passive monitors. Uh, active monitors, such as these uh, M-Audios that I have up here, um, have the uh, amplifier in the monitor themselves, so you don't have to send it um, a, a more powerful signal than you know, what it needs. Uh, and you also don't have to buy that extra piece of gear to amplify the signal. Uh, passive monitors are just that. Uh, they need an external uh, power amplifier uh, just to boost the signal up loud enough to, uh, to drive the speakers. Uh, here I have a couple examples, uh, the M-Audio uh, BX5D2s, which we have up here. Um, it gives us a variety of inputs, either XLR or TRS, uh, so depending on the outputs of your interface or however, whatever cables you have laying around, uh, you can connect to. Um, also very comparable to these are the KRK Rocket 5s. Uh, which again are active <coughs> monitors, um, but they also have an RCA uh, input. So if you want to, if you have that cable lying around or don't have the XLR or TRS to get to it, there you go. Yes, I'm familiar with XLR and RCA. I'm not familiar with TRS. What is that? Uh, it's tip ring sleeve. It's a quarter inch. Oh, okay. Cable. Okay, I'm with you now. Yeah. So there's uh, three different sections on the connector. Um, this is a balanced cable. Um, you might also see this as an instrument cable, where that is TS, just tip and sleeve. Um, the the, uh, the uh, third uh, wire in here is, uh, is what balances out the, the signal. Yeah, it uh, helps reduce noise when within the cable. Mm -hmm. Next, um, if you want to record something, you're going to need a microphone. 
Um, and there are a couple different, two different types of mics, three, um, but I'm not going to get into the third type really. There's dynamic microphones and condenser microphones. Dynamic microphones are your pretty standard live, like a vocal mic, um, like this shirt, um, SF57 here. Uh, and instrument mics, they don't require phantom power, you just plug them in, turn up your preamp to set a level and you can go. Um, they're used a lot to close mic instruments, guitar cabinets, drums, that sort of thing. And then condenser microphones, which require phantom power, um, which is a 48 volt signal that's actually sent through the microphone cable. So if you're going to use condenser mics, you'll just have to pay attention to make sure that your interface has phantom power capabilities in it and that you have that enabled um, when you hook your condenser mic up. If you don't have phantom power for some reason on your interface or mixer, um, you can buy little boxes that are 9 volt battery powered or plug into the wall that will supply that 48 volts. Um, condenser mics give a more detailed sound than dynamic mics. They're used a lot um, as overhead mics on drums or if you're recording an orchestra or a band, something like that, you might just put two, a stereo pair of condenser mics up to kind of capture the full performance. Um, I'm going to give a couple examples here. Like I said, dynamic microphones, a Shure SM57 or an SM58, they're industry standard. Um, the president for the inaugural address has been using SM57 microphones for years. The joke is that they're bulletproof, so that's why I use them. <laughs> um, and then I also have the Bayer Dynamic uh, TGI-52D, which is a dynamic microphone, but it's a very small um, diaphragm, and it actually comes with a clip to clip on the horn of a brass instrument. So if you had maybe a jazz band or something that you wanted to record, that would be an easy way to get a mic up in front of the horn. And then if he moves around, the mic moves with him so you don't have any weird sounds. Um, couple condenser microphones, uh, Shure SM27, sort of a higher end um, condenser microphone. Uh, the Blue Spark, which is what we have here. Um, thanks to Blue for sponsoring our uh, technology today. <laughs> um, and then also the Blue Yeti. Um, which has selectable patterns. There's two capsules in it. So it can do stereo, it can do regular cardioid, which is like a directional microphone, or it can do omnidirectional and capture sound from all sides. And that also has built-in conversion. Basically, the audio interface is built into that microphone. It can plug into your computer USB, you can record from that mic, and then it also has a headphone output for you to monitor. Um, it's used a lot in podcasting, um, maybe if you just want to do an instructional video for your students or something, that would be a good way to capture the audio, video, uh, audio for that. And that's the end of the slideshow portion. Now we're going to move into actually hooking it all up and making it work. Does anybody have any questions? All right. Get out of this here just a second. We have this cool little camera that our professor uh, let us borrow. Um, all right, let's see. I'm going to go ahead and plug everything from here. Um, all right, you want to start with the interface, Jim? Yeah, sure. Uh, like I had mentioned before, we are using the Focusrite Sapphire Pro 24. Um, as you can uh, see here, uh, there's the two XLR inputs on the front. There we go. Uh, these are also combo jacks, so if you do have an instrument cable that is quarter inch, uh, you can use that as well as opposed to, uh, to XLR. Here's your, your preamps uh, and your button for phantom power for condenser microphones. Um, your uh, main monitor, uh, speaker level, and it also has um, one headphone output as well. Uh, on the back, there's more ins, uh, quarter inch ins and more quarter inch outs. Also the firewire cable. Um, that connects to your computer and it can do MIDI as well. Yes, um, you see right here we actually already have our monitors plugged in. I'll go ahead, this, uh, if you're not familiar with FireWire, let's get it here, alright, this is a FireWire 800 port, um, which is what newer Macs will have on them, and then I'll actually get the other end because this is a turnaround cable. Um, the Sapphire Pro 40 actually uses the older version of FireWire, which is FireWire 400, um, which is that connector. So that's something to pay attention to uh, when you're purchasing this. Which uh, FireWire does it use, and which do you have in case you need an adapter or something? Or if it uses USB, make sure you have the right USB. Basically, um, a lot of audio equipment will use FireWire because it has a higher bandwidth than USB does. So it allows more data to be transferred across there. So um, the nice thing about this Pro 24 is that it's bus powered, so 
It's powered right from the computer. And maybe, there we go, we have power. So um, you wanna go ahead and talk about your monitors then? Yeah, sure. Um, these are the M-Audio BX5 D2s. Uh, like I said, here's the, uh, the multiple outputs, or inputs rather, on the back of it, and your um, volume control. Um, and one key factor is to know that these are active monitors. Um, it has a power cord coming out of the back of it. So I don't know if any of you went to Russ Nagy's uh, presentation uh, yesterday at, at around five o'clock, but that's one way you can tell if you have an active or a passive speaker, if there's a, a power cord um, coming out of the back of them. So let's go ahead and flip those on. All right, so now we should be able to get audio output. I'm gonna go ahead a um, little trick, a uh, Mac trick for those of you that don't know, if you hold option and click this, uh, the what is usually your volume up here, it actually will let you easily change your input and output device. So I'm going to go ahead and set both of these to use the sapphire now so all of our audio is going to come out of there. Get a little bit of level coming out of there. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and open up GarageBand so we can get a little audio happening. In GarageBand, when you have, uh, we have two tracks up here. One is an instrument track, which we're gonna get to in a second. Uh, when we get the keyboard hooked up, the other here is an audio track. So we wanna set the import, input source. Now, if you notice here, it shows up with built-in microphone. Um, so what I have to do is go into the preferences in GarageBand and actually tell GarageBand to look for the Sapphire rather than the built-in um, audio on the computer. So if I come here, I can output to the Sapphire, take a second to change, and then we can set the input to the Sapphire. Um, this is usually the first place to go if for some reason you're not getting audio where you think you should. Um, this is the place to check. Uh, check your preferences here, make sure your inputs and outputs are coming from the same place. So now, all right, that's there. Our outputs should be through these monitors. Now we'll go ahead and hook this MIDI keyboard up. Um, this keyboard uses a USB. Um, there's two different USB. How do I get the video? Oh, I'll just minimize it here. Yeah. Um, this end of the USB plugs into the keyboard. Um, it's also, it's typically used on printers and a lot of peripherals will use this shape of connector rather than the other one. Um, get that in there. And the other end is just your standard USB standard that's USB. on all Macs and PCs these days. Um, this is USB 2.0. Um, now there's a lot of USB 3 things coming out which uh, offers a lot faster data. So I'm sure we'll be seeing those. And um, the biggest thing would be to watch is if you have an older system, it may not support USB 2, in which case you'd have to just look for a, a controller that uses USB 1.1. So now uh, this is powered up. Um, go back to GarageBand. And we're going to select this piano track. And now, let me get it there. Um, we have the piano, uh, it's, the keyboard is transferring MIDI, um, we have a piano sound in GarageBand, and then there's all sorts of different instruments in GarageBand that you can choose from. I have some third party ones then installed as well, so if you just open up GarageBand on your computer, don't be alarmed if you don't see all of these um, sort of different sets here. Uh, what I'm going to do is actually show you a drum kit, because it's cool this this uh, M-Audio Axiom, the way it's programmed, which is a, one of the default settings, these will default to like a kick, snare, ride cymbal, crash cymbal, open hi-hat and close hi-hat, so it's real easy to just do it. Um, so you can really use this to put a whole sort of uh, orchestration together, everything from strings to pianos to keyboards to drums. Um, you can put a lot of things together, and then you can also um, record audio over that. So, Joe, you want to get some microphones going? Yeah, sure. Uh, rear XLR cables. There. Uh, so, what we have here are uh, your standard three-pin XLR cables. Do you want to 
flip back to the video. Yeah. There's uh, two ends, uh, the male end and the female end. And I'll let you guys figure out why they're called that. <laughs> So it just goes into the bottom of the mic here and into the first mic input. Now with this being a condenser microphone, we're going to have to engage uh, phantom power. So I clicked on the 48 volt button right. and we should be getting sick. No, we don't want to vote. All right, the monitor is off. So go ahead and turn that up a little bit. And then Um, so yeah, if you, I can go back to the video real quick and try it now. Um, yeah, you can see here is the preamp knob. This will adjust the amount of signal you put in. Um, I don't want to go too high because I don't want to squeal or anything. And then you want to go ahead and hook, hook up the 57 as well. Oh, sure. <coughs> um, just a reminder on that, that's a condenser microphone, so it does require uh, 48 volts of phantom power. Um, that's always something to check if for some reason you're not getting audio um, when you should, think you should be. Um, that's always a place to go. Is that working as well? Yep. All right. Um, so that's sort of a setup. Uh, does anybody have any questions? We're going to move into some troubleshooting things here then, if no one has any questions. I just have a really quick question. Way sure. back in the beginning, you were talking about the different types of computers. Mm -hmm. Like, would you be able, would you have the same capacity? to use GarageBand on any of those, or is it limited on the mini and stuff like that? No, um, the especially with the new ones, uh, GarageBand is full power on all of those machines. Now, if you have like the really expensive Mac Pro model, you're gonna be able to do just hundreds and hundreds of tracks, but I mean, the computer, all the computers that are out there um, will handle anything that you're probably gonna throw at them. The newest round of um, Mac minis and the cheapest MacBook Airs are like 10 times as fast as my laptop here from a couple years ago. So if I can run it on here fine, then you shouldn't have okay. any problems. Okay. Mac Air does not have FireWire, then, does it? Uh, the MacBook Airs don't have FireWire anymore, and the MacBook Pro with Retina displays do not have FireWire. They're moving to the Thunderbolt. Thunderbolt. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing a few Thunderbolt interfaces pop up on the market. Uh, UA makes one called the Apollo, but it's quite pricey. A lot of those are still pretty pricey at this point. I think Abbott has a couple, has at least one. I would say so, yeah. And then Apogee, I think, is working on one. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Um, I, th I think I missed, what, what are you using to connect between your keyboard and, and the computer? What model? Uh, that's just a USB. It's just USB. This keyboard outputs USB. Okay, but you have something uh, in between. So you're not correct connecting directly to the YouTube. No, the keyboard is directly connected to the computer. This one has, uh, here, let me pull up the video again. This has a USB out right here. Um, oh, whoops. Um, so yeah, it has USB out. A lot of newer uh, keyboards and MIDI controllers will have USB built in. Um, if you have an older one that doesn't have USB on it, or just a, even if it's a newer one that doesn't have USB on it, you can buy little interfaces that take the MIDI and convert it to USB and send it over USB. I know Motu makes one, M Audio makes one. Um, they're usually not too expensive either. Okay, thank you. Anything else? All right, so troubleshooting, because whenever you put all this stuff together, you're bound to have some issues. Um, so the first thing to do whenever I'm troubleshooting something is I shut things off, let them sit for a minute or two, and I turn it back on. Um, it seems like that doesn't, shouldn't make any difference, but it does. Um, the second, like I said, is check the input settings in GarageBand or whatever um, program you're working in, um, either down here for the individual track or overall in the preferences menu. And it's always good if you go into your system preferences uh, and check in the sound area, you can select the output and input as well. Um, always check to make sure those are set on the right, uh, the correct device. Um, the next thing, 
could be a driver issue. Joe, you want to talk about drivers a little bit? Uh, yeah, drivers are basically, uh, it, they tell your computer how to talk to, uh, say, your audio interface or your MIDI controller. So if you don't have an updated driver, you'll be sending information to it, but your computer's like, what is this? I don't know what to do with it. Um, so it's always important to uh, check those out. They're all usually up on, online on the, the company's website. Um, like there's a specific section of the website called downloads usually that will contain um, all the drivers that you could ever need. Um, and check too, another thing could be uh, if the dri current driver you have might not be valid. If you up update your operating system or update your GarageBand or Logic or whatever software you use, sometimes that'll break the compatibility with the driver. So um, I suggest if you ever upgrade are gonna upgrade your OS or your software, do a quick Google search and see if people are having compatibility issues. I know back when Apple came out with Lion, um, I got really excited and updated like the first day and then went to open up uh, Avid's Pro Tools and it just didn't even work. It would just, the screen would pop up and say it's not supported by this operating system and it would close down. So always uh, double check those kind of things before you upgrade anything. Um, Google is your best friend. Um, a lot of, I know a lot of companies will have a forum, uh, part of their support website where people will post issues they have and you can find fixes and stuff like that um, through that website as well. Um, you want to show them the mix control? Oh, okay. do that. Um, so like, how, like I outlined in the uh, presentation, uh, there's different audio interfaces you can buy from different companies like Personas or Focusrite or Avid or uh, Apogee. Um, and they might come with their own proprietary software. Um, this is basically controlling the, uh, the internal routing on your interface. Uh, so you can, you can tell it, you know, uh, I want input one to go to this output so I can reamp it or send it to this effect, out, this outboard effect, and then bring it back um, through a different, uh, uh, different input. Um, also, another thing, too, is that I think with the loopback feature, um, you can also route uh, software um, on your computer. So if you want to, you know, say record something from YouTube, um, you can do that with your your audio interface. Um, um, these and the the sort of the downside to these things, each type of interface you have is, is going to come with its own sort of version of this. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's always a place where some confusion may arise and exactly what is going where. Generally, a default setup on any of these is always one-to-one. -one. So your first mic input is your first mic input, your second is your second. Um, but you can do some crazy things if you want to get into it. Um, so that's sort of always something to check. If you're having an issue, open up this program and just go back to the default setting and it should fix all of your problems um, it, with both inputting outputting, routing, mm -hmm. etc. And if not, Google is your friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I want to talk a little bit, this is the Enigma software, which comes with the Axiom series of MIDI controllers. And basically, you can use this software. This is how you program what each of the different buttons and knobs and faders on all this do. Um, same sort of thing. We actually, when we were um, practicing for the music tech recital this morning, I was using the same model of keyboard, but it was one of capital instead of mine, and it was programmed differently. So when I was hitting all these drums, it wasn't making, it was like making whistle sounds and all sorts of crazy things because it had been programmed differently than the one I had. So if you're having an issue like that with your keyboard controller, um, check into its software to program, or you can even program them on the device if you want to look it up in the manual on how to do that. Can you save those and transfer them between yes. units? Yes. Mm -hmm. So like right now, if I come to device, I can click download from the Axiom. It will save it here and save it in a file in this program. And then if I plug that other keyboard in that I was using earlier, um, I could upload back in that same thing, upload to, and it would move that back. And that will change, like this one, if you notice over here, there's 20 different presets that put things in different places for different programs and, and things. Um, and that's where you can edit all of that information. And same thing with the uh, interfaces. Like if we set up 
a routing thing on, yeah. on Nate's interface and then want to expand it to, to my bigger one, you know, we just save the, the preset on that and then load it up on my computer and it'll work fine. Any other questions? We're moving through quicker than I expected. <laughs> um, but yeah, so as far as just GarageBand goes, uh, how familiar are all of you with the GarageBand software as far as some of the capabilities that it has in um, doing things? I see you. Uh, yeah. I got nothing. Sorry. <laughs> all right. Well, so GarageBand, um, the big thing, and what sort of when I first got into doing all this, um, what caught my attention about GarageBand, I was probably in I was in middle school at the time, was all of the loops that were built into it. So I was able to easily come in. And I could say, all right, let's have a beat. We'll have this one come in here. Yeah, turn those down. It'll loop. Um, what I did right there, by the way, is a little yellow spike uh, pop up. The C on your keyboard um, stands for cycle. If you press the C, that pops up. So so then I could come in and let's see what else we got going on here. Let's get a sim happening. And you don't have to do this live while I'm doing it. You can put things in. Um, if you open, if you double click, you can open up the piano roll here at the bottom. I'm going to go ahead and close that menu. So I can come in, uh, go back to the beginning here, and I can take this note, and I can move it up there. So then, see so it changes. So all of the loops are completely editable. You can record in your own loops um, and save them as loops, or you can just save them into an audio file via MIDI or um, USB. Um, so that was sort of something that got me into it really, and then what really took off was when I found out you can actually, if you have an electric guitar, you can actually plug straight into the, the mic input on the side of your laptop, and it'll record that guitar, and then you can go in and use some different um, amps, amp simulations. I'll go ahead and pull one of those up here. If you go to guitars, and we'll do funky rhythm. That basically over here pulls up a simulation of an amp that gives it a certain sound. And if I had a guitar here, I would sort of show you that sound. We can put the sim through it. Yeah, I guess I, well, I don't have the audio though. No, you can. Oh, I can just do the sim here. Yeah, so just sort of show that on the sim track here, I'm just gonna add the amp simulation to it. Um, and if you open up this window here, this sort of is your controls for that. So let's do a British game, because I like rock and roll. So you see here now that that's So I can change. So you can just um, so you can take it out of what you're listening to, or you can solo, which means that's the only thing that you hear. Um, a cool thing about MIDI tracks on in GarageBand too is if you don't have a MIDI keyboard and you still want to enter in notation, um, you come up here to Window and do Musical Typing, and now you can see a keyboard here on your. Um, screen showing you what knows what. So, and then I can make the velocity controls make it louder or softer, although it might not affect this patch too much. And then I can adjust the octave. Um, if you see here, the tab key sustains, like a sustained pedal, um, and you can also pitch it. similar to the controls that you have on the keyboard. Um, so if, if you don't have a keyboard available, maybe you just uh, haven't gotten one yet, or I know I've done different things on an airplane, this is an easy way to just try and punch
punch in things um, on the go. And the hotkey for that is Shift Command K. Um, to bring that up, I'm a big fan of uh, shortcuts and hotkeys. Um, does anybody have any other questions? I know we're still a little early here. With the, the drum kits, can you remap the keyboard to lay it out the way you want it? With this? Um, yes, but, uh, in GarageBand, that is done through the, the keyboard software. Like you can change what, basically you have to go through and find, okay, I want the sound that's on C3. And you program C3 to this pad and, you know, D7. But can you relay out the map, not for the pad itself, but for the keyboard? Yeah, in the Enigma program or whatever program your synth comes with, you can remap. But you, can, you can't do a default map through GarageBand? No, to, not through GarageBand. To change the general. Now, if you're using Logic and some other higher level programs, they have like a learn function. So you can say a, set a parameter, click learn, turn the control you want, and then that will automatically be mapped to that. Okay. Um, but GarageBand doesn't uh, include that feature. Um, anyone else? Uh, is there any anything uh, that you guys may want to see that you missed? If there's something that you wanted to see, we were expecting when you came in here? I know we're still a little early. Mm -hmm. Apologize for that. Is there an easier setup to use for just simple two-track recording if you wanted to play some live piano and then play it back and record vocals with it? Yeah, sure. Um, it, to kind of get rid of all of this, you could get an interface like this, plug the mic mic in. Um, the Zoom recorders, the highest, the Zoom uh, H4n, um, has USB and can be used as an audio interface. So you could literally just plug it in. Go to your preferences, select the Zoom H4n. You could play your piece, that would be recorded, and then you could go back um, and you could sing into the Zoom, or if you had a different microphone, like that, the Blue Yeti I was talking about as well. <coughs> and it's the controls at the bottom of GarageBand there. That would yeah, any, to, to change any of that is all done right here. Um, yeah. So like, oh, I'm on the, up here. This basically selects your inputs um, based on what your settings are in the preference menu, like I said earlier. Is, is there a way to adjust um, the metronome for <coughs> like a human playback? Like I've recorded something without a metronome, I enter that track in there. Is there a tap feature where I can go to get the um, all of the numerics to line up with the recording? Um, that turns on your click track. There is a way to change the uh, tempo in here. Let me look it up real quick. Um, here's where you can change the tempo. I don't believe that uh, GarageBand has a tap feature. Okay. You mean quite quantize it? Yeah. Um, uh, that note in the bottom left corner, the word note, if you click on that. Down here, yeah. This will quantize a MIDI file that you have in there. Okay, but not a live To the recording. tempo, but uh, no, not live recording. You can, some of these loops. Yeah. You can, well, it's important to make that distinction too. Yeah. Uh, between audio tracks and MIDI regions. Mm -hmm. uh, with this audio region that uh, Nate has up for his beat, I mean, we can compress it and maybe time expand it. Uh, it's just we can't change it once it's been recorded. Uh, but yeah. with MIDI, you know, you lay something down, if you flub one note, you can go in there with surgical precision and grab that note and move it up or down. Yeah, and you can quantize the MIDI. You can. Um, there is the option to quantize the audio. This isn't going to be a good example because it's the loop and it's already set to go. Um, the nice thing, the built-in Apple loops will all translate across different tempos. <coughs> um, your audio files are going to take a little more finagling, something you've recorded to move across tempos without hearing artifacts from stretching or time compressing those. Do you have a question? All right. uh, is there anything else? All right, well, uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming today. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask us. Um, we'll be up here tearing things down here for the next little while. Um, and thanks again. Enjoy the rest.